Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Community Tech Data Hub, and welcome to our online viewers as well. Uh, my name is Vladimir, and I'm part of the uh, Community Tech team. Uh, before we begin today, I'd like to take a bit of time to tell you a bit more about some of the, the programs and services that we have uh, here available at the Data Hub. Uh, one of them is actually the um, Data Growth Coaching Program. And basically, um, what works is that um, as a company, you may um, actually uh, be looking for data sets, or you may already have uh, data sets that you're trying to leverage. And the great thing about it, too, is that uh, if you're looking for some help on how to best leverage uh, those data sets, for example, uh, we have some uh, growth coaches that would actually spend some time to learn more about your business and uh, the needs for your, your, your service, essentially. Um, and basically, um, in terms of the, the categories or the areas of focus of these various growth coaches there. Um, anything data management related, for example, um, data science, um, basically uh, deep learning as well, so anything um, uh, machine vision recognition, for example. And the latest focus really is that we now have a couple of uh, growth coaches that focus on um, HD mapping, so basically spatial data. And again, how it works is that you would reach out to us, uh, quintech.sle slash data, and you'd actually be able to uh, request to meet with one of these growth coaches, and um, we'll set up an introductory meeting, and then they'll be able to learn more about your business and delve into that uh, the sp specific challenge that you're experiencing with your data set. Um, thanks to the uh, Next Generation Network uh, program for supporting our advanced technology platform and making this Data Hub session possible, um, the Next Generation Network program is offered through a partnership between the Center of Excellence in Next Generation Networks, so CENGEN, and the Ontario um, Centers of Excellence on behalf of the uh, Government of Ontario. Um, for those who may not be aware yet, we do have a number of um, advanced technology platforms, so some TED beds um, here at the Data Hub, and one of them includes the, um, it's a, basically a commercial grade, traffic free cloud test bed, and it's available here at the Data Hub, and uh, your company could actually leverage that um, for your, your business or your services there as well. Uh, we have Lisa Klimstra here today. Um, Lisa is the business engineering manager at SendGen, and she'll be able to tell you a bit more about um, how you might be able to leverage the uh, Next Generation Network Program testbed there. All right? Hi, Lisa. I'm just going to give you a microphone. Oh, sorry. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> okay. There we go. Just give it a few seconds. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so I do work for SendGen, and this will be just a three-minute sales pitch. I know we're not supposed to do sales pitches, but it's a free pitch <laughs> that's aimed at helping small-medium enterprises overcome commercialization barriers. So SendGen is a not-for-profit organization funded federally and provincially. Uh, we do partner with the Ontario Centre of Excellence, as Vladimir indicated, and uh, we do have a number of SMEs actually in the region currently conducting projects with us to help them overcome commercialization barriers. Uh, so we do have four data centers in Ontario. One is in the basement here. We're very fortunate to have it here in Communitech in Waterloo. One in Mars in Toronto, Invest Ottawa, and where we're headquartered in Canada. Uh, through our infrastructure, uh, you have access to bare metal servers, a varying RAMs, we have CPUs, GPUs, cloud tenancies, uh, we have an enterprise-scale private cloud at your disposal to do testing. I would say about 80% of the testing we do is scale testing. Uh, just to give you an example, if we have an SME with a handful of clients uh, who is wanting to test to a very high volume, they can stand up an instance of their application in the SendGen cloud. We can then spin up a number of virtual machines to simulate the type of volume they're hoping to achieve. Uh, generate traffic and push that across the application, see where they lay, uh, where the constraints lay for the customer, and what type of compute power or resources would be required at that volume. This information is really helpful to our customers, even if they fail and don't uh, attain the volume that they were hoping to and realize a constraint at a lower volume, at least it's on our test uh, infrastructure and rather not than with a live customer and they can have an opportunity to adjust and tweak before going live with the customer. Uh, also this information helps them extrapolate what type of operating expenses they can expect from the cloud provider at that high volume. Anyway, I would be happy to speak with you more. Uh, I will leave some cards with Vladimir 
And uh, we do partner with the Ontario Centre of Excellence, who offers up to a $50,000 matching grant to help offset your uh, costs with doing a project on our infrastructure. But it is free to use our infrastructure. We provide project management, engineering support, and at the end of the project, we author a white paper uh, as an unbiased third party that you can then take to validate your solution to potential investors and potential clients. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Lisa. All right, everyone. Uh, with that said, I am pleased to introduce today's speakers, uh, so Patrick Miles and Dr. Hamid Tizhush. So Patrick is the CEO of Euron Digital, a St. Jacobs-based medical device and software company. Um, prior to Euron, Patrick spent 18 years at Teledyne Dasla in Waterloo, most recently as vice president of uh, business uh, development. He's an uh, advisory council member of the Digital Pathology Association as well. Um, Hamid is a professor in the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Waterloo and the director of a Chemia Lab at the University of Waterloo also. He's a member of the um, Waterloo AI Institute and faculty affiliate to the uh, Vector Institute. And as part of his um, commercial activities, he's the AI advisor of UN Digital Pathology. Everyone, please welcome Patrick and Hamid. How's everyone doing? Great. Great. I'm just going to transfer some technology over here. We'll see if this works. While this is uh, setting up, I want to thank uh, Vlad and Kevin for inviting Hamid and I to, uh, to be here today. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. I, I live about five minutes away over this direction here, so it's, it's fantastic to come to uh, this great place. And I, I think the last time I was here, it wasn't really a good uh, time to be here, if anybody knows what this building was uh, before it became CUNITEC. So anyway. Yeah, it was a police station. Okay, so as long as we're all uh, as long as we're all clear on that. So, okay, so um, we're going to talk about democratizing pathology uh, using image search. So, just a quick introduction. Uh, I'm uh, as uh, Vlad mentioned. I'm Patrick Miles. I'm the CEO of Huron Digital Pathology. We're we're actually in uh, St. Jacobs, Ontario. We're kind of up on the hill. So, if you go through St. Jacobs on King Street, go up the hill. And we're on. Uh, we're in. Um, uh, we built a, uh, um, a facility there where we do all the research, uh, design for both uh, microscope, uh, digital microscope uh, instruments, and then increasingly more uh, software uh, products for uh, digital pathology. We've been in the market for about a dozen years now. We've been supplying whole slide scanners for digitizing pathology slides. Um, we have customers at um, various high profile. Um, institutions such as Harvard, uh, MD Anderson, Ohio State, uh, and uh, we're, we're growing it and we've, we, we have the good fortune to have added a, a really uh, significant uh, software component to it, which we'll be talking about today. Hamid, uh, who I'll introduce you in a bit, I had the good fortune of meeting Hamid uh, about three and a half years ago. Uh, Hamid is, uh, has, is the director of the Chemia Lab, which is pretty much the largest lab, machine learning lab in the world focused exclusively on image search for pathology. There's like 20, group of 20 plus growing with uh, funding from both the Ontario and the Canadian government. Huron is the industrial partner, so we're the, we're the folks that are commercializing the technology that comes out of Hamid's lab. And uh, over the last, uh, the demo that Hamid will give, over the last uh, uh, 10 months, we've, we've demoed about a thousand times over uh, in, across North America, Europe, uh, and in the Middle East. Uh, and we've, we've actually demoed in, in China, but that was remotely. So uh, very, very exciting time for a, for a company that's, uh, that's uh, in an interesting space. So a little bit of context. So really what we're seeing in, in, in the practice of pathology is that there's a real crisis where you've got, um, simultaneously you've got a, an increase in the incidence of cancer and disease at the same time that you're seeing a uh, severe shortage of pathologists and laboratory services. So that's, that causes a real 
a real issue um, in, in terms of being able to bring services to the world. In North America, we're seeing that um, it, in Canada and the United States, we have about one pathologist per 50,000 people, which is, uh, you know, we could argue whether that's adequate or not. Anybody who's ever had to wait for a pathology report can, can argue whether that's a bad thing or not. Uh, but that's actually, the, the problem is increasing. Uh, over the last 10 years in the United States, there's been about a 20% decrease in the number of pathologists. Fewer are getting in, and there's quite a few that are retiring. It's, uh, it seems like a problem, but when you, when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really an awful situation where there's like one pathologist per million uh, residents. So being able to gain access to uh, pathology expertise is at a severe premium. So what's happening in the world of uh, digital pathology is that there's a real transformation from looking at glass slides under a microscope to using digital workflows, to using digital technology to view, share, collaborate to improve uh, diagnosis. So what we'll see over the next five years is we're going to see a um, basically hundreds of millions of slides digitized, exabytes of data, tens of millions of pathology reports, all in an effort to really address these issues with the shortage of pathologists and to improve diagnosis, increase discovery, really make, uh, make this a, a, a better world. So that's really where there, a lot of the effort has gone into over the, it, it will go into over the next five years. It's, um, it's very much a greenfield opportunity. In North America, maybe 5% of slides are digitized. Most cases, you go to Grand River Hospital, they just got their first scanner a couple months ago. For the most part, they're looking at slides under a glass slide, but that's rapidly changing. So really, from a, from a data standpoint, uh, really the issue is, you know, here's these exabytes of unstructured image data. How do you, uh, how do you search in that data? The other question is, uh, you know, there, there's these tens of millions of pathology reports. Basically, the collective knowledge of pathologists has been captured already. It's in pathology reports. It's sitting in a filing cabinet somewhere in a basement of a hospital. All that knowledge is there. How do you tap into that? And how do you leverage the data to really uh, improve diagnosis, to um, optimize treatments, and even how do you make connections between the histology data that's on the glass slide and the, the genomics data that's increasingly becoming uh, uh, present in, uh, in various areas? So there's, there's, there's lots of questions to be answered in the, in the area of, um, of pathology and, and, and big data, and that's, that's really what we're trying to address. So we've, uh, Huron's developed a solution we call Scan Index Search, which is a combination of scanner hardware, something we've been doing for a dozen years, and where it's kind of like the 80-20, where the 80% is the, is the scanning part of it, which is the stuff that everybody understands. There are digital workflows. We're not the only people that are doing digital pathology. But the 20% is the surprising part, which is really the index and search, where we're able to not only create these images, but we're able to index them so that they can be quickly and easily searched. And Hamid will talk a little bit about kind of how that works. So let me give you a overview use case, um, something we call virtual peer review. So let's say, let's say I'm a pathologist and I'd like to get the opinion of uh, one of my esteemed colleagues who is maybe down the hall, they may be in another city, they may be on vacation, I may need to schedule a time to meet with them, to consult with them. So typically what'll happen is I'll, um, if they're down the hall, I'll walk down the hall. If they're in another city, I'll, God forbid, mail them a glass slide that may get lost. Um, or we set up a meeting for uh, two weeks from Tuesday to discuss a patient's uh, situation and, and to get the opinion uh, that can help with the diagnosis. The problem there is that uh, it's, it's very inefficient. Uh, a couple years ago, the Ontario government did a, uh, uh, the inspector, uh, um, the auditor general did a, um, uh, a study. They basically said that only half of all biopsies were processed within the 14-day guideline. So obviously, the, the first part of that is why does it take 14 days to do a diagnosis? And the second part is why are only half of them getting done in that time period? And a lot of that relates to the ability for a pathologist to get, the, get to the expertise of a subspecialty expert who can help them make that diagnosis. So here's what we're doing with, uh, with our solution. So imagine you have a pathologist who's looking at a slide and, and they, you know, they may have a question about what that 
what that slide is, at what that um, particular piece of tissue is. Typically, again, they would go down the hall, they would talk to their pathologist in the other city, or they'd set up a meeting two weeks from now. But imagine if um, all of those slides that were in, a, in the hospital or hospital network were digitized and indexed and could be com uh, very easily searched. So the pathologist opens up a slide, and highlights a certain area that they'd like to know a little bit more about and queries the search engine. And instantly, up come similar images from other patients where the tissue is similar, similar from a morphological standpoint. But not only that, but all of the, the report data from all of the pathology reports are available as well. So the pathologist can not only search instantly and receive those, uh, those query results, but they can also read the pathology reports from their colleagues. And so they can look at the colleague on the left, which is uh, Dr. Johnson, who we, uh, has a lot of, the pathologist has a lot of respect for, or the other two colleagues, and then based on that can make a, make a diagnosis. And that ability to do that instant and virtual peer review, it, it's something we really take, it, take for granted in, in our world of, uh, uh, of YouTube, for example, if you want to fix your car or your dishwasher, you do a search and you find somebody that knows how to do that and you can get basically instantly, uh, you know, find out how to do something you didn't, couldn't do before. That's basically what we're unlocking with, uh, with image search to really connect the pathologist to the vast expertise of, um, of other experts. And so we can basically, by doing that, uh, we have the ability to um, uh, basically make computational consensus a reality within pathology. And where this gets really interesting is, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, a, a hospital network and a lot of what we're doing is we're engaging with hospitals that have large repositories. I was just uh, uh, sending an email to a um, pathology um, a department in uh, Sweden. They have 1.8 million slides. And um, that's uh, something where they can use it internally. But imagine, um, you know, the ability not only to query what's in, a, in your own repository, but be able to ask, you know, what's in a, a repository in a different, uh, a different country. And so really where this comes back to this, this idea of democratization is imagine somebody in a, 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 a doctor, a pathologist, a nurse practitioner, somebody helpful in uh, sub-Saharan Africa was able to access the collective knowledge that's at a hospital in Europe or in, uh, in North America. So let's say they could access the collective knowledge that's at Princess Margaret. How much could that improve the, uh, the, the diagnosis? Or imagine they could uh, access the, the collective knowledge that, that's at the Cleveland Clinic. How can that improve the level of, and quality of life of, uh, of the residents of, uh, of Africa? So really where the potential for, um, for image search is to connect underserved areas with the knowledge that we kind of take for granted in, in, our, uh, in our country and in other countries that have uh, uh, access to, uh, to pathology expertise. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Hamid. He'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the nuts and bolts. So the technical folks here are really gonna enjoy this and uh, then we'll wrap it, uh, after that we'll wrap it up and, and open up for, uh, for uh, discussion. Hamid? Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so uh, it is one of the things that we like to do to raise awareness within the community because what we are doing, this has nothing to do with usual, I don't know, uh, business side of things or academic ego, but what we are doing is really being done for the first time ever worldwide, which is enabling clinicians, physicians to search within large archives of medical images. We have tons of them and they have been diagnosed, we, have, we know the outcome, but they are not being used. So there's a lot of human knowledge that is not being used. So and hopefully we can contribute to making some use of that. So everything begins with indexing. So you have to index medical images because medical images are unstructured. So you look at an image, you need an expert to understand what is in it and nobody has described what is in the image. So we have to index it such that the computers can understand and process it. Now the whole slide images are very large. So the glass slides that Patrick was talking about is a piece of glass with human flesh processing some liquids on it fixed for, for, for a long period of time. So we have glass slides from civil war in, in US. Uh, so they, they stay for a long time. 
those pieces of glass are usually put under the microscope, but when we digitize them, they become gigantic files. Each, each image is easily one gigabyte, two gigabytes. So uh, those images are big. So how do you process them in computer? They cannot be processed with enough resolution. So uh, because uh, doctors go back and forth between different magnifications, as they call it, so they get they zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. I will show some example. So y you have to process at the high magnification such that you see the detail. That could be that for lung cancer you don't need much resolution, for, but for uh, uh, recognizing Hodgkin lymphoma you need a lot of resolution. So you need to keep that resolution. Uh, the processing takes too long, believe it or not. As, as fast as our computers could be and our GPUs are capable, they are not still, they may not still be fast enough for pathology data. Pathology is the very meaning of the big data. So if one patient comes with seven, eight biopsy samples, you have seven, eight images, each one of them one, two gigabytes, so that adds up really fast. So the processing may take a long time and make the approach really infeasible. And it may need a lot of storage. So we are telling them, yeah, you don't need to put the glass slides, keep them in the archive in the basement of the hospital. You can digitize them, but digitized information also needs storage. So we need to somehow intelligently uh, index those whole slide images, biopsy samples on piece of glass. So indexing means basically compact representation, how can we represent, how can we make computers understand this is a biopsy sample of thyroid carcinoma? How can we do that? So that, that was the challenge that we have spent some time to figure out. So if, if you look at this uh, uh, sample, so this is, this is a big image, this is relative, well, it's not a really big, it's 80,000 by 100,000 pixels. So, and to give you some idea, uh, if you know, if you are in the field of machine learning, you have heard about ImageNet. ImageNet is a collection of more than one million images that AI experts have used to train AI agents. So ImageNet has given us a lot. So those one million images that everybody used to train AI agents, we can fit within this one image. So this is so big. Pathology images are really gigantic. So the first Stanford computer would be to really recognize where is the tissue, where is the glass, which appears to be trivial for us. Uh, we look at it and we see the tissue as human beings. Say, I know this is the tissue, and the rest is really white or bright, so it's not tissue. But the computer has to figure it out such that it can only index the, the tissue, the part of the tissue that is on the glass slides. So then we patch so to speak, the glass, uh, the, the, the part of the uh, tissue that we are seeing, so, and we will group it in different body, in different tissue types. Now, the tissue types that the computer understand are different from the tissue types that the pathology understand. So in pathology, we have only four tissue types, epithelium, uh, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and so on. Computers may recognize nine tissue types, which may not be meaningful for the pathologist, but the indexing is not for the pathologist. The indexing is for the computer to form a basic understanding of the human tissue and save it in a structured way such that we can go and find it again. So, and from those grouping, those colors that you see, the computer will grab samples. So we, we assemble a mosaic. So that mosaic is a fraction of size of the original tissue, which could be, again, two, three gigabyte. So now we reduce the size to make it possible to process. But of course, if you, if you grab some patches, some tiles from that big tissue, you cannot miss anything that is important. If you miss something that is important, we are is defeating the purpose. So we want to index and say this is papillary carcinoma, this is long adenocarcinoma. You cannot miss the part that is important for indexing. So and then we put the images that we have ha we have in that mosaic. We put it through a so-called deep neural network that many people are using in different form, different architectures. We have been playing with them. So, but the fundamental thing is we abandon the classification. We don't use artificial intelligence as classifier. We are convinced that classification is, and I have lost many friends over this, is useless 
for, uh, for medical field. We don't want to classify. The classification is the, is the job of the radiologists and the pathologists. We want to assist. So we don't use the output, but we get some what we call attributes or features out of that complicated artificial neural network, which is millions of multiplications and additions, some connections, whatever it's doing, it learns everything in the image that is important for the computer, edges and corners and colors and their distribution. So it tries to figure out if you see a piece of cancerous tissue, you see a lot of purple because hematoxylene is reacting with the cell nuclei. So, but it doesn't put a name on it, but it figures out that if you see a lot of purple, that's a good indication that could be cancer. So we get those features, but those features are just numbers and they still take a lot of space. So that now we have a tissue sample, a whole slide image of WSI with those patches, with those uh, small squares that you see. Now the computer has selected those parts and said, if I index those parts, that's good enough to understand the malignancy, that's enough. I don't need the entire, the entire whole slide image. So we have the mosaic, and then we get for each one of them the features from the intelligent, super smart, deep neural network, and then comes the crucial idea, we convert them to barcodes. So we take the features, those numbers that represent tiny structures in the image, and we somehow convert them to zeros and ones. Why? Well, if you want to search in large archive, you cannot compare numbers with numbers. It will take forever. And you cannot ask the hospitals, go and buy 10 supercomputers to do your calculations. They are already struggling with the, uh, with the, with the investment in infrastructure. So we have to make it really easy for hospitals and clinics to adopt the technology, which is all you need is a regular, ordinary PC to use the technology. If you want to do that, you cannot do it without barcodes. All of us, we know barcodes on the grocery items. Well, our barcodes are a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit longer, so 1,024 bits, because we want to pack a lot of information inside them. So we call it Bob, Bob indexing, bunch of barcodes. So the tissue of cancer becomes represented in a bunch of barcodes that we, uh, that we save. So here are three examples of those barcodes, just to visualize how they look like. They, we cannot interpret them as humans. The computer understands them. And now is the good thing. So there's no patient information in those barcodes. There's nothing in there. Anybody can capture it, uh, reverse engineer it. There's nothing in that. And we can send now this. If I want to send that image, the tissue sample from hospital to hospital for consultation, that would take forever. The digital image is big. Why should I do that? I send two kilobytes of binary information and say, have you seen this patient? So it makes the communication a lot easier. So if we take these attributes and features that the smart AI gives us and we generate our barcodes like this, what we do, we basically look at the changes of the attributes of the tissue. So we go change by change. If we are going down, we assign a zero. If we are going up, we assign a one. Very simple in technological term is the gradient of deep features, whatever it means. So we are just looking how things are changing. We encode it in a binary form that is fast and easy for processing. Now the doctor can start, to, now you index everything. And now physicians, pathologists can do search. They can search for an entire tissue sample. They can say, I have a patient with this biopsy sample have we ever had patients with similar biopsy? This has never been possible. We can't do this at the moment. Or we can just grab a small part of the image, the detail that we are interested in, and say, OK, have you seen something like this? If you are looking, again, at difficult cases like lymphoma. Uh, if it is an easy case, we, we may just look at the entire image. Or we select a specific region. And everybody talks about cancer, and we talk about cancer too, but we have, according to the World Health Organization, we have more than 6,000 diseases. Only 500 of them are cancerous. And for all 6,000, pathology are used. Of course, we will also start with cancer. This is a lot of awareness is around cancer. But nothing in the search technologies is specialized on cancer. We can do it for any infection. 
for inflammation, for anything, that the pathologists usually use the microscope. So if, we, if I want to show you uh, a demo, uh, so this is, these are some biopsy samples. So each one of them is a human being, is a piece of flesh of a human being. All of them are cancers. So lung cancer, salivary gland, um, kidney, bladder, prostate, breast, so we have more than 85 different diagnoses here. So uh, th these images have been all, these images have all been uh, indexed, and now we can search. So we can, usually the process is that you will open a case that has been assigned to you. If I open this case, so assuming this is the first one on the left, uh, on the top, top left, and this is a brain cancer. And when I open it, it has been assigned to me as a pathologist to diagnose, well, I don't know what that is. So I look at it and I examine it. And I examine it first by going in detail. So now I'm at almost 20x magnification. And then I can go back and forth. So this is what, this is everyday work of a pathologist. I go back and forth, look at this. That looks okay. I see a lot of pink. Pink is good. Pink is cytoplasm. And here I see a lot of dark. Uh, purple, that's okay, there are not too many of them, but suddenly here I see too many. So I'm putting it really simply. This is brain glioblastoma, one of the aggressive type of breast cancer, uh, brain cancer. Quite easy for experienced pathologists to diagnose. Virtually no, no challenge. They open it and they know what it is, so they don't have any challenge with that. Now, when I open this, you see on the left-hand side, that the software immediately searched and found similar patients. So the top match that the software found is this. This patient has been already diagnosed one and a half years ago. And we can get all information. And this patient was diagnosed and evidently diagnosed, confirmed with glioblastoma. And the software is telling me, your patient is very similar to this patient who has been evidently diagnosed with glioblastoma. Now, this is what Patrick was talking about with virtual peer review, as if Dr. Johnson, my esteemed colleague, who did diagnose this patient, is in the room with me, and I showed him my patient. I said, what do you think? And he is saying, I had a patient like that. And it was glioblastoma because of this and this, because we can retrieve the report, and we can show it, as if Dr. Johnson is, would be here. So that, that may not be enough for me. The global matching may not be enough. I may go and say, yeah, okay. Pathologists love to go in details. They go and actually, as a matter of fact, tell any of the cell nucleus, all the cell nuclei, they may start counting them. According to the tables that we have from World Health Organization, we start counting them and say, if I have this many cell nuclei within 500 by 500 uh, microns, that means grade two whatever cancer. So they'd love to go in detail, and they have to, because otherwise you may not be able to, um, to, to do the actual diagnosis. So they may say, OK, this region is of interest. Can you also search really in details? Then we go and search in details. So that was biopsy sample to biopsy sample, patient to patient. And now you zoom in and say, this detail is important for diagnosis. Go search. And you saw that. I, I drop this green square, and immediately the results come. That's real time. We can do 100 million searches per second on an ordinary computer, no GPU. So that's the potential of using binary information. And I look at that. OK, what is the best match? It brings back again the same patient. I said, the data is screaming at the pathologist, your patient is similar to this patient. This is glioblastoma. In this specific case, they will not have a problem. They know it. This is an easy case for the pathologist. So if I go back, so let me get back here. Did I come back to the wrong place? OK. So what we did is, OK, so um, uh, no technology in medical field will get commercialized without rigorous validation and publication of the results. So when I heard there were some companies, I, I, I guess you know about the blood and you get that much blood and whatever. There was no one single paper on this. How can you do this? 
How can you commercialize medical devices? And you are not reporting validations of this case, that case, this hospital, that hospital. So we have been looking, and the challenge is we need large number of cases. We cannot do search on 10 patients or 20 patients. We need a lot. So t t gratefully, thankfully, Na National Institute of Health in US has created a large archive of database. It's called the TCGA program, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas. So, and the data of 33,000 patients are in there. Biopsy sample, genome, everything. This is a gold mine for everybody who is working on carcinoma. So we downloaded that. Our uh, Dell uh, EMC, one of our partners, helped us with their infrastructure to do that. And we, uh, we, uh, this is the part that, okay. I, I can't say that. <laughs> so we have, we, so the reason that you see this because we have, uh, we have finished the validation on the 33,000 patients, and we have submitted the results to Nature, and we are waiting to hear, and we didn't want to disclose anything because platforms like Nature, they get upset if you publish something before they have reviewed it, so we are being a little bit careful in that. So just to give you a verbal account, so 33,000, 17,000 surgical, surgical samples, and 11,000 diagnostic samples, 25 different organs in that database, 33 uh, cancer types. So it is a very heterogeneous, very, uh, very uh, diverse data set. And we run the image search on Wandem, and what we did was both horizontal search and vertical search, which is, uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> so you are in a selected audience that you're sharing this again, so we don't want to upset nature. Uh, so we removed 900 patients just for low quality of the images. We processed 29,000 cases, basically at 20 times magnification. Uh, 26,000 were tumors, so 26,000 biopsy samples that were cancerous. 17,000 were frozen sections when during the surgery or after surgery we take sample to make sure that the cancer has been removed. And 11,000 something were diagnostic cases, regular, regular biopsies. So that generated 20 million images of 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. So nobody has processed this many images just to search for diseases. So we are searching for diseases. You give me an image and we go in and we search for similar diseases. So we did horizontal search, which means whatever you give me, I assume I don't even know what that is. We searched across everything, brain, bladder, uh, prostate, breast, everything. So that was one thing. And you see the diagonal on this so-called heat map is well colored and intensive, which means if I gave brain, the software found brain. By comparing it to all the, why we do that? First of all, we want to verify a fundamental basic capability. Can you recognize organs? It's not easy to recognize organs by looking at tissue samples. If you zoom in too much, you cannot even distinguish between animals and humans. If you're too close, you cannot even say what organ that is. So it was important for us to verify that. So it may not have immediate, uh, uh, immediate uh, diagnostic uh, two, uh, value. However, if you look at this, which for the first time we are using a cord diagram, which is using genetic research. So, and the question is, let me go back, maybe I can, okay. So now this is the cord diagram. So if I search for low-grade glioma in brain, most of the time we find low-grade glioma. Sometime we find glioblastoma. And when we search for glioblastoma, most of the time we find glioblastoma, sometimes we find low-grade glioma, but also sometimes we find other stuff like lung squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, what is the relationship? When I search for brain glioblastoma, why am I finding sarcoma? Is there a relationship, yes or no? So one is we can verify, so if I, if I search for lung squamous cell carcinoma, most of the time I find the same thing, but sometimes I also find lung adenocarcinoma. The same thing for lung adenocarcinoma. But when I search for mesothelioma, which is the asbestos type of cancer in the pulmonary domain, 
you see that's all over the place. That's one of the things. There is a lot of relationship. What is that? So we didn't have enough patient for that case, but we show it to three pathologists. And unanimously, the first reaction was, hmm, there seems to be a relationship because we have, I have epithelium here, epithelium here. So it's not totally nonsense, but we have never seen this relationship. So it's not just about making, helping to find the right diagnosis through majority consensus, but also discovering new relationship by looking at the big data. So if I'm searching in a database, if 30,000 patients gives us that, what would we get if we search in 100 million globally or nationally or just in North America? So if, if you see that this, everything that is solid color here is correct in terms of categorization of cancer. Everything that is in the middle, those tiny dark lines are either discovery, there's something new, there is a relationship, or there is something else that we don't know. So search is not just an assistive tool for diagnosis. It could be opening up the way, for example, in the genomics. Personalized medicine without image search is not even imaginable. So let me go back. No. So uh, the vertical search is different. So we assume, OK, you are searching for breast. I only search in breast or kidney or brain. I don't need to search in everything. Why do you do that? Because now I look at it, and I know this is breast cancer, but I don't know the subtype. Is it? What is it? I know it's lung cancer, but I don't know. Is it adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma? And the subtype, of course, is a paramount to be recognized correctly for the treatment. So if you, if you don't have the subtype, the treatment may not be effective. So we do the vertical search, and we, we, had, we had numbers in terms of 91% accuracy, 98% accuracy. We had also cases that we had low accuracy, 58%, 33%. Those were cases that you see the red one, we had only 43 patients. <laughs> So search among 43 patients is not meaningful. So that's one of the results that we have reported to Nature. I, for every subtype, we need at least four or 5,000 patients. Then search start making sense. But if you have 39 or 43 patients, what do you want to search in 39? Unless it's a rare case, like Hodgkin lymphoma. OK, then we are talking, but not for that. You see that in some cases, we got scary by getting 100% accuracy. And we double check that, triple check that, quadruple check that. How are we getting 100%? We are not used to these numbers. Up to four or five years ago, the best numbers we would get was 70%, and everybody was happy. We get 70%, we can publish. And now we get 99%, 100%. We also get 0%, or talking majority 15. So this is ultra conservative that I search and the, the majority of search results will give me the diagnosis. But again, those cases that we are getting 0% are those cases that we don't have enough patient. So you have 20 patients, and you look at the top 20, of course, you will not find meaningful results. Those cases that we approach 100, we have a lot of patients. So we have enough patient to make uh, a good diagnosis based on majority road. And you see that in, in this, in this uh, diagram, you see it too, that here co it collapses, the accuracy comes immediately down because we don't have enough patient. The more you retrieve, actually, the more you make a mistake. You cannot rely on majority if your data is not big enough. So that was a, that was a major finding for us. 43 patients versus 178 patients for thymoma. And 300 patients versus almost 500 patients. So, we, we can you say that again? So you're saying that the long tail of data improves accuracy? The more you have, the better. So that's what we can say. The more you have, the more we can rely on consensus building to image search. If you don't have, if you have a small database, it's you cannot rely on top 20. You may rely on top three. So that's the size of the data matters, and of course, the diversity of the data. Image search, 
makes sense on the internet. It doesn't make much sense on my computer, on my laptop. So you need a, you need a good size repository. So we, had, we, had, uh, we just came back from Orlando Pathology Vision Conference and we had a, uh, we had a presentation there, we had a workshop, uh, we had a poster that, uh, that, was, uh, that was presented there. And uh, so let me see. Uh, the, the, the validation that we did with 33,000 patients, basically for frozen section, we have accuracies 93%, 97% for kidney, for ovarian cancer, 99%, very scary. Diagnostic slides, prostate, 98%, sarcoma, 99%, thymoma, 100%. We are not used to these numbers. So, and what we wrote in the, in the paper that we submitted to Nature is, look, we need bigger data sets to test more. But it seems we are onto something. It seems that image search is the technology that can remove the single biggest problem in medical imaging, observer variability. Because doctors cannot agree with each other. Why? Because it's a difficult task. It's not easy to look at those cell nuclei and cytoplasm and say, what is it? And of course, the more the better. And we saw 80% correlation between number of patients and the accuracy that we can achieve. So the more the better, which means we have to put everything we can do to go toward uh, uh, regional, national, and we can dream global repositories of histopathology biopsy samples such that we can, we can um, really exploit the data set. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. So um, I'd like to open the floor up for questions. And uh, if you do have any questions, what I will do, I'll just raise your hands, and I will pass around uh, the catch box. So, if you, again, if you do have any questions, just wait uh, for the catch box there. And to our online viewers there as well, if you have any questions, just uh, post them on the, uh, on the stream, and we'll actually be able to address uh, these questions that are still at the end. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. It, the, the, the technology itself I thought was really smart and yet so simple. It was just uh, mind-boggling. But I had uh, more of a question on the collaboration between the industry and the research. If you can talk a little bit more about, you know, how did you actually make the, uh, the research actually sort of, you know, industrialize that, and, and what are the challenges that you faced? And also, what's the plan to actually t bring it to, um, to those sub-Saharan countries that actually need it? Um, you know, where are you storing that data? You talked about it. So it, it sounds like it's more of a centralized storage still. Um, so, you know, how is that happening? How is, this, how, how is this happening in practice, essentially? So I can say something about the, how the collaboration and commercialization com came to uh, get established. So we were fortunate. We, we got funded by Ontario Research Fund, Research Excellence, which is uh, specifically designed to support Ontario-based companies. Huron is pretty much the only Canadian company who does uh, manufacture scanners for digital pathology. So we submitted from University of Waterloo that we want to work and uh, bring AI technologies within digital pathology. Huron was naturally the best candidate to work with. Ontario government uh, thankfully uh, realized that and we got funded for five years. And we have an agreement that Whatever we do uh, in the lab, Huron gets a free exclusive license for pathology to commercialize. So we can do other stuff in other fields of medical imaging, but for pathology, Huron Digital Pathology is the exclusive commercialization partner of that ORF, Ontario Research Fund, uh, um, uh, agreement and consortium to commercialize. I guess with other things, uh, Patrick might be able to say something. Yeah, it's a really good question. So I think uh, I think Hamid kind of covered the the sort of the relationship that we have as uh, you know obviously Hamid with uh, you know on the the research side of things, us on the on the commercialization side. Um, it, your question about how do we how do we roll this out to um, underserved geographic regions? It's a really good question. So. So when I mentioned about you know the 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 kind of state of the art right now is you have these um, two three hundred thousand dollar scanners these digitizers that are being deployed at hospitals uh, in Sweden in in in, uh, in the Netherlands across Canada United States 
Um, obviously, that's not going to fly in, in areas like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So I think in general, what's needed is a, is a, is a much more uh, progressive, uh, adaptive approach to making the digitization tools uh, available to these areas so that they can very easily digitize these images. One of the, um, one of the, tech, the, the reason the technology is, is quite applicable is that when, when Hamid talked about how we're, we're basically able to take a gigabyte worth of data and, and really represent it in a compressed format that's in kilobytes, that data is like a text message, so it can be very easily transmitted through satellite, uh, satellite networks, through cell networks. Um, basically what you'll need is, a, is some form of digitization sitting on top of a microscope, or it could be a scanner, but obviously the, 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 the cost has to come down. And so we're, uh, we're actively talking to various companies to be able to basically provide that from a purely from a digitization standpoint and a connectivity standpoint. Now, the, um, the, the question about where are the, um, uh, where is the data being held? So, so what we want to do is, uh, is kind of a combination of, of our own uh, being able to basically put together our own repository and index, but also work with established players, like let's say at, at some large hospitals who have a desire and, and already like, this, this idea of remote consultation, it's already happening like in the Middle East and Abu Dhabi, they're consulting with Ohio State and, and hospitals in Brazil are, are working with MD Anderson. So that stuff's already happening. So we, we need to work with those institutions and, and, and work on an on a incentivization plan that they'll want to collaborate with these. We'll probably have to bring in some uh, third party uh, partners that are already in the philanthropic space who want to participate in it. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of heavy lifting, but it's it's uh, it's really about making the the tools, democratizing the tools, so that they can be in all of these places. Uh, one of the uh, pathologists we work with uh, through the European it's um it's an Eastern Caribbean uh, digital oncology network, and they, he goes to Africa on a regular basis. They literally got cell networks in the one village that he had been going to. Like that was just such a huge step forward and so what we would do is we would leverage that so we're not going to try to put in the infrastructure that we have at the at this wonderful data hub we're going to try to you know make it more accessible so does that answer your question all right it's a very good question thank you uh, any more questions for, from the audience um, when you look at the thousands or hundreds of thousands of slides that have to be prepared, um, even in the developed world, are, is there the equipment right uh, now to read and digitize um, all of this information or slides that are being done, say, even through Canada or the United States? It's, the numbers just seem astronomical. And then when you look at the size of that data, one image being one to three gigabytes, it's just mm -hmm. uh, enormous. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, it's, it's, it's the biggest challenge. There's, um, there's about an uh, estimate of about 160 million slides that are generated every year in hospitals, like biopsy slides. And again, only maybe 5% maybe of them are digitized. So, um, so the challenge is, yeah, how do you digitize and how do you get these gigapixel images? Where uh, what we're looking at is how do we, um, how much, how well can search um, perform with lower magnifications, smaller pieces of tissue? Can we just take a snapshot of a, of a piece of tissue under a microscope with a digital camera and just create a smaller image? Can that image stay there? Because what we're doing is that image stays there. All we're doing is communicating that barcode. So there's only like a kilobyte a day. It's like a text message. So that is a very efficient way of of sharing that, um, but that's that's basically the the approach you've got in in most hospitals that are deploying digital pathology. They're buying, you know, two hundred thousand dollars scanners. They're 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 digitizing at forty times magnification, creating two mega uh, gigabit images. But obviously that doesn't that doesn't scale. So uh, there are there are uh, we were just at this uh, the conference that Hamid and I were mentioning. There were two scanners there that were designed more for. Um, Third, third world uh, um, emerging countries that were more, the cost, the cost um, aspect was quite a bit lower. And there's it's actually a very vibrant digital microscope 
market that already exists. These are basically just cameras that go on top of microscopes that everybody has. So, you know, all the pieces are there, the cellular networks, the microscopes, everything is there. This technology kind of, you know, kind of brings it together. So I, I think we've got everything. It's just going to take a lot of, a lot of effort and a lot of collaboration. Any more questions? So how do you manage with data corruption? Data? Corruption. Corruption? Corrupted data or uh, it's not corrupted. How do you manage to distinguish? So what exactly do you understand on the corruption? Uh, when is the data, cor in, in pathology, the data is corrupted to us when it is not sharp enough, it's, it's blurry. That's no. corrupted data. Anything in the digital form is likely to be corrupted. Yes. So when you digitize, after some time, it is likely to be corrupted from extraneous sources. So how will you manage to control it? But uh, well, that, that, that problem in general through information theory has been solved when we establish internet and communication channels. We have package that go in and we check certain bits. And if bits are manipulated, we know that the package is corrupted, we request another one. So this is not specific for us. Anybody, when you zip a file through the internet, that technology is in use, and it checks whether it's the version that you send or it has been somehow corrupted. But, but corruption to us means something else. <laughs> it's not the information theoretical corruption. Perfect, thank you. Um, one more question? No? Perfect. I just have the one question, where, where do I get one of those? Because we got to get one of those. For it's just, it just looks so much fun. I'm, I'm surprised people aren't asking more questions just to hold it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, they're pretty cool. You can throw it around. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Patrick and Hamid, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for offering your time and effort to present uh, the uh, Data Hub sessions uh, today and sharing your insights on the future of pathology and the role that uh, image search plays in bringing about that future. So we've put together a little uh, GIF. Um, it's a something to show our appreciation um, for you uh, taking the time to present there uh, today, and then Ashley will actually be able to um, present that there to you now. <laughs> Um, we'd like to thank you all for coming, and thanks to our online viewers there as well. Lisa, thank you very much for uh, coming today and sharing more about the SendGen uh, programs and services. And for those that will be uh, in the Ottawa area in, uh, on November 13th, uh, you'll actually be able to find out more um, on uh, how Canada's tech community is working to, uh, together to grow the digital economy at the uh, SendGen Summit in Canada. Uh, to find out more, you can actually visit sengensummit.ca. And finally, please remember that thanks to our partners, we have a commercial-grade, traffic-free cloud infrastructure here at the Data Hub if you're looking to leverage that um, for, your programs, for, for, for your services there. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.